Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Matter of fact, uh, when I was uh, received the invitation, uh, maybe I was uh, too excited because I was invited to speak and they said, how would you like to come down to Argentina? Yes. Would you like to speak at the conference? Yes. And then maybe I didn't even hear the topic, but I knew that I was coming to Argentina. I was very excited. And then when I got back, I said, why crossbreed? <laughs> I was wondering, what the heck is that topic? So I was thinking, well, okay. I started to ask some folks, what do I say about crossbreeding? So I asked some of my board members and they said, remember, who pays your check? And I was thinking, where am I going? I'm going to the World Holstein Conference. Okay. And uh, I said, well, I have to talk about Holstein. So really my talk is not why crossbreeding, but why not crossbreeding? Or why not to crossbreed? So in the United States, we just had this survey published, uh, February 2016. So it's from uh, data that came from 2014. And there's uh, some information there on the different breeds, uh, the percentage of herds, it's, it says operations, but the percentage of herds that would have Holstein, so 89.6. And uh, in the United States, our, the Holstein breed would make up 86% of our national population. Second most popular breed would be Jerseys, and then down the line. And if you go to almost the bottom where it says other, so other is the, the place where we put everybody who's not a purebred Holstein or Jersey or Isher, et cetera. So some of those are folks that are breeding uh, their Guernseys to Holsteins to, to bring them to Holstein. Some of them are people that are breeding Brown Swiss to Holsteins to bring them up to Holsteins. And some of them are people that are actually interested in, in crossbreeding. But the percentage of the people that are actually interested in crossbreeding would maybe be about 3%. About 3%. So it's not that big of a deal within the United States. But there are some folks that uh, are interested in. So it's something that we as Holstein breeders need to be aware of and need to be able to have a conversation with them. So, what kind of questions are they asking? What are they saying? Why are they even interested in crossbreeding? And as I said, I'm, I'm a Holstein guy, so I don't, I don't really know why people get excited about crossbreeding. So I started looking around and I went to uh, some of the AI companies, the people that are selling the semen for the, the, the use of crossbreeding. And these are the reasons that they list. Improved production, improved mastitis resistance, improved fertility, easier calving, etc. Well, I mean, are these true? Um, at least we should, we should investigate them to see if there's any credence to them. The first one, improved production. Well, how can that be true? So, I want to give you answers to that question, why not to crossbreed? And I want to focus it on maybe three different times. It's almost like a, uh, the story of the uh, Christmas Carol. So the ghost of, of Holstein past, the ghost of Holstein present, and the ghost of uh, Holstein future. So in the past, I don't think people really realized how we have changed our breeding programs over the last 10 to 15 years. We've heard two speakers already that have uh, mentioned that, and I just want to emphasize what, what it is that they are, are saying. So if we put uh, Holstein history and just summarize a few of the uh, major changes, we need the advancement of a slide. But uh, what it says here is we started off back in 2002. We put uh, emphasis on reducing somatic cell score. We still don't have it. And then, uh, Okay. Okay. So then in 2005, 2011, we had uh, increased emphasis on health and fertility. We introduced the traits productive life, daughter pregnancy rate, 
Cavi knees, calf survival, and then more recently we really focused, pulled out uh, the components that are involved with uh, fertility and feed efficiency. So <clears throat> I'm going to show a lot of genetic information, but to convince you and to uh, uh, make you feel more comfortable that the genetic information is accurate and showing uh, what really happens in reality, we have this slide here, which is on actual production. And we used our most current TPI formula. And uh, we took the, the cows that were born 2007 to 2009. The reason that you take those groups of cows is because you want to give the cows the opportunity to live out their lifetime and we can have some lifetime measurements. So what you see is that as you go up the scale from the lowest TPI animals to the highest TPI animals, you are selecting animals that have longer lifetime production of fat and protein per day of life. They're staying in the herd a longer amount of time. Their somatic cell score is lower, and their final score, first lactation final score values are higher. So by using a, an index like a, a TPI or an LPI or the German index, we're all doing similar types of things. We are really selecting the, the right type of cattle, those that are going to produce more, those are going to last longer, those are going to be healthier, those are going to be more fertile. Don't do this to me. Okay, so let's look at some uh, genetic trends. This one is uh, very convincing. You have all experienced this when you go and milk your cows. They are producing uh, more pounds of fat, more pounds of protein. Maybe uh, less obvious to everybody, or at least what we need to emphasize to those that criticize the Holstein breed, is that there has been a purposeful intention of keeping the components, percent fat, percent protein, relatively stable over a long t period of time and actually increase, increasing most recently. So if, if you look, starting at uh, uh, 1975 all the way to the present time, our components, our percent fat, percent protein, are actually increasing within our population. So that's a very desirable thing. This slide, I love this slide because it really shows the power of selection. We did have increasing somatic cell score, which means uh, more incidence of mastitis. Recognizing that's a problem, we have developed genetic evaluations for somatic cell score, put it in your selection index, and you can see 2002, a dramatic decline, dramatic incline, decline in somatic cell score, breeding healthier cows. And there's a number of traits that we look at and we say, okay, maybe we need to improve this. Let's uh, have a, a genetic evaluation and let's indeed select for it. Uh, fertility, a trait that Holsteins have been criticized over the years. If you look at the last uh, 11 years in particular, dramatic improvements in fertility. Dramatic improvements in fertility. And if we break this out into heifers and cows, the heifers have been improving for a long time. If you take any breed of heifer and breed them, the ones that are easiest to get pregnant are the Holstein heifers. And that just continues to get more and more the case as we improve the genetics of the Holstein heifers. Now because our cows produce so much milk, it has become a little bit of a challenge to get the milking cows, the lactating cows pregnant. But here you see what we are doing through the power of selection, uh, improving cow conception rate. And then if we look at calving knees, uh, the genetic trends on calving knees, we have uh, the blue line, which is the ability of the cow to produce a calf easier, and the red line, which is the, uh, uh, the size of the calf uh, by the side. But these traits are definitely improving, uh, resulting in easier calving. Now this is a new trait. It's uh, one that was listed by people, uh, as far as those that are promoting crossbreeding, and it's just called pure livability. And it's a little bit different than productive life, or a little bit different than uh, amount of time in the milking herd. This is uh, a measure of cows, whether they leap, whether they, whether they are leaving the uh, herd 
uh, because they die on the, on the farm. And that's a big economic importance of whether the cow is dying on the farm or whether she's been shipped off the farm to beef. And uh, we we're just, we've been recording this information for a long time, but we are just now turning it in, into a, uh, a genetic evaluation, which will be introduced later this year. It has a positive correlation with productive life. So even though we have not been directly selecting for this trait, we are indirectly selecting for it as we select for a longer productive life. And here is the genetic trend in cow livability, particularly from, from that year 2000 when you can see that you know, all around the world, globally, we have been putting more emphasis on health and fertility traits within the Holstein breed. And that line is very dramatic going up. So when we step back from, from the last 15 years and look at what we have been doing collectively as uh, breeders of Holstein cows all around the world, it's, it's quite a, uh, impressive, uh, quite satisfying. When we talk about this within the United States, this is our, and, and within Canada and, and elsewhere, this is our religious moment. This is when we say hallelujah, amen, brothers and sisters, because this is, we are really heading in the right direction. Every trait that you could possibly point to and look at Holsteins and say, well, I want to crossbreed because this is a problem within the Holstein breed, baloney. We are addressing all of the major issues that we have. We're making significant genetic improvement in, in the traits that are related to production, components, health, fertility, and this trend has been going on for the last 15 years. So that is very, very good news. Now, another concern that people may have is, well, you know, everybody else is crossbreeding. You look at the poultry industry, you look at the swine industry, they crossbreed. But you have to realize, we're not like them. When people d produce a, a crossbred chicken or crossbred pork to sell to farmers to raise, that's a very complicated process that they're going through, and they have a, a very specific plan in doing that. So in this uh, uh, picture here, we have pedigreed animals, which would be less, like we have registered Holsteins, and then they just grow up the numbers, that's called the multiplication step, and then they start uh, crossing the lines, uh, A with B, and then C with D, and then cross those lines together, and then finally get the broilers that they sell out to the farmers. Well, those lines A and B are selected specifically so that they combine well together, and they are selected specifically so that when the cross of A and B is crossed with C and D, you're going to get the type of animal that you really want. So lines A and B would, would be selected for like high production, lines C and D would be selected for a high fertility, and then when you're looking at the commercial animals, you cross them together and your commercial animals are quite valuable. Nobody in the dairy industry is doing that. Nobody at all, nobody's talking about it. So we are nothing like chickens and, and swine. That ju that's just not a, uh, a valid argument. <coughs> Holsteins are being bred for all environments, whether it's the intensive California situation or it's the grazing in New Zealand, just like we heard the, the speaker early this morning. And other breeds are pretty much doing the same thing. They are trying to breed an animal that will be good for all environments. Unfortunately for them, while they do that, they are uh, focusing on production traits and they're allowing what, straight, what traits of strength they may have had, for example, fertility or health, or health, to slip away. So the Holstein, we're a bigger breed, we're focusing on all traits, and we're making good progress. The other breeds are trying to catch up, and as they are, they are trying to catch up, they are losing some of the, the traits that are indeed valuable, that would be valuable for a crossbreeding uh, project if that's what they were really intended to do. So we have here the genetic progress. We talked about the Holsteins. Holsteins are in blue, so somatic cell score, it's going down, which means that our cow, cows are more resistant to mastitis. If you look at the jerseys, they've been focusing on other traits, the somatic cell is going up. If you look at another trait, like uh, fertility, we focused on this quite a bit. Last 13 years, our fertility, our daughter pregnancy rate is going up. At the same time, the jerseys are going down. 
And then cow conception rate, uh, which is the important trait uh, within the lactating cows, you can see a dramatic improvement within the Holstein breed, while there's been no progress or negative progress um, in the Jersey breed. So whereas we have truly been breeding uh, a cow for all environments, for all management situations, other breeds that want to be involved in the dairy industry have a great larger challenge and uh, have not been producing an animal that would really be valuable in a crossbreeding program. So I don't buy that uh, uh, the dairy cattle should follow the example of other species like chickens and swine. It just, it just doesn't uh, stand up. So there are misconceptions about uh, crossbreeding. Dairy industry is not a crossbreeding industry. We're not, we're not set up, organized to do that. And then there is a lack of understanding about how you use the purebred PTAs for a crossbreeding breeding situation. So I've been working with our former uh, Holstein president. Uh, he's now retired, or a little bit retired. <laughs> he's uh, teaching at uh, South Dakota State University and he teaches a class on dairy breeds and breeding. So every year or so we, we, get, we talk and uh, we put together some examples of what do you really expect if you were to take a Holstein bull and breed it to a Jersey cow or take a Jersey bull and breed it to a, uh, a Holstein cow. So here's the information from the last genetic evaluation from the uh, USDA, the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding website. So you have the number one proven Holstein bull within the US, Super Sire. You have the number one proven Jersey bull, uh, Machete. And you see that for, we'll just look at pounds protein, uh, 71 for Super Sire, 41 for, for the Jersey bull. But what does it really mean when you look at that 41 pounds of, of protein? I mean, I think that most people would say, oh, well, if the, bull, if the Jersey Bull is plus 40 pounds for protein, then you get heterosis. Oh, this must be, this must be quite valuable. Well, this slide is a little bit hard to read, but I, the reason why I have this on here is that the information is public. Anybody can go through and uh, uh, calculate exactly what you expect when you use a uh, Jersey bull on Holstein cows. Uh, the key components is you have to take into account the difference uh, between the breeds. So Holsteins are far superior than Jerseys as far as the uh, basic genetic level. And then if you were to use a, a breed, a different breed, you would obtain something from heterosis. So it's that combination of breed superiority plus the benefits of heterosis to predict what you would get in a crossbred. So if you would go through the calculations, this is what it comes out to be on these two bulls. For Super Sire, uh, if you breed him to a Holstein bull, you get exactly what you would expect from the evaluation that's uh, provided. If you breed him to a Jersey cow, you, you obtain that breed superiority plus the benefit of heterosis. So I guess I need to modify my answer a, bit, a little bit. Crossbreeding may be a good idea if you are thinking about crossbreeding Holstein bulls to Jersey cows, <laughs> but uh, certainly not the other way around. Uh, if you would consider using a Jersey bull uh, to breed to a Jersey, it says his evaluation says, um, and it comes out to be only 20 pounds uh, for, for protein. Only 20 pounds. So what Randy tells his students is that PTA protein of 20 pounds is not very impressive at all. There's many, many Holstein bulls that uh, meet or exceed that. So if you take that view and, and then also look for not only the Holstein bulls that are plus 20 pounds for protein, but are also positive for feed efficiency, positive for fertility, positive for a type, and then have low somatic cell score, easy calving. You see that just within North America, we have 1,202 Holstein bulls that are gonna be a better bull to use on your Holstein cows than the top Jersey bull would, would be. So that's an incredible amount of opportunity in diversity just within the Holstein breed that there's really no need to be looking at another breed like Jersey or, or others. And if you look at, uh, there's many uh, computer programs that uh, assist 
agreed us to do this. One that we have is called Red Book Plus. And uh, what it shows here is that we have the 1202 bulls, and then they are actually much better on uh, protein, fat, productive life, somatic cell score, and type than the average bull in the population. So it's very, very easy to find uh, superior uh, Holstein bulls that uh, are better than the top Jersey bulls in production and are positive for the traits that you, that if you were interested in crossbreeding, such as fertility or calving ease, these bulls are better than uh, breed average uh, for those characteristics. So given the changes that we've made to our selection programs, and then also given the, the uh, ability that uh, genomics has, has added to us, I think this is a great, op great time to be Holstein breeders. Uh, we're going to have rapid gains in health, fertility, production. Uh, we've seen that. We've had three speakers so far that's telling you the same message when you look at the, the traits of interest and, how, and what we want to improve. Uh, we see it. We see it not only in the genetic numbers, but we see it in, in actual uh, performance. And then the, uh, the final topic is genomics. So we've talked about genomics. Uh, we see the benefits of genomics. But when you, did, when you look at genomics and bring that into the crossbreeding question, the genomics really helps the Holstein breed a lot. It helps the Holstein breed more than any other breed. And it really just kind of kills the discussion on crossbreeding. So what we have, whoops. <laughs> I need one more slide. See that? You make the same mistake time and time again, and you learn from oh, okay. We got it. Uh, so what, what I have here is the uh, number of daughter equivalents for the different traits that you get from genomic uh, testing. And it's related to heritability. So the lower the heritability, the more valuable the genomic information is. So it uh, is valuable for improving the production uh, evaluations, confirmation, but then it grows in importance in calving ease, somatic cell score, productive life, and fertility. So that genomic information is really helping the Holstein breed. And if we're looking to further pull away from other breeds, the genomic error is the time that we'll see this happen. And I, just to illustrate that that is indeed what's going to happen, let's look at the top 50 bulls for both the Holstein and the Jersey breed, sorted by net merit. So back in 2006, we would see that the Holstein, the top Holstein bulls were $120 better than the top Jersey bulls. Which means back in that time, we were pulling away from the, the Holstein breed, I mean, from the Jersey breed each year, each generation. So that's that number there, that 120 superiority of Holstein over Jerseys accumulates each year, time after time after time. Genomics comes along and we say, well, we want to improve the low heritability traits fertility, health traits, and now look at the superiority of the top 50 Holstein bulls versus the top Jersey bulls. It's $340, almost three times more improvement by using a Holstein bull versus a Jersey bull. And this is the, just the, the difference that is going to be obtained in the next generation. So it's all additive. So the, the Holsteins are pulling away now, and they're going to be pulling away again in the next generation and more and more. So I think the, the, the question of, of uh, why crossbreed, or will we be crossbreeding, or will we see more crossbreds within our populations, I think the answer is no. We've done everything that we should be doing. We uh, are focusing on a balanced cow. We've taken into account uh, health and fertility in our selection indexes. Uh, we've uh, incorporated uh, genomics. Uh, we have large reference populations. We're exchanging semen uh, amongst one another. And when we look at it at an, on a domestic uh, level of one breed versus another, uh, we are just far outpacing uh, the advancements that the other breeds are, ma are making. 
And unless those other breeds keep up, they're no longer valuable in a crossbreeding program. So there's lots of opportunity to improve your herd within the Holstein breed. 1,200 bulls just from US and Canada. You add in the bulls from around the world and uh, there's many, many uh, choices uh, for Holsteins. No reason to crossbreed. So the future, what I believe is the future, is that profit-oriented farmers of today are going to stay be sticking with Holsteins and uh, uh, that's the choice of the past, that's the choice of the, of the current times, and it'll be the choice of the future. So thank you very much.